Coming up this week on Pleasure Boater, this Intrepid just came back from a sea trial. It's about ready to be delivered to a customer, but first, they're going to do a little fine detailing on it. They're going to correct any defects that the quality control people found out about. And you may wonder, how do you build an Intrepid boat? We're going to find out coming up next on Pleasure Boater Dead Ahead. Welcome aboard another edition of Pleasure Boater, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, I'm your host, Captain Ted Jones, and as we said in the tease to the show, we're going to show you all about intrepid powerboats and how those are made. And greeting me here is Ken Clinton, the president of Intrepid. Ken, welcome to the show once again. He's been on the show many times. We want to learn how you make these boats here, and first of all, you go to a dealer, right? No, actually, we don't have any dealers. There's no dealership network here with Intrepid Power Boats. And what you do is you come right here and you walk into our lobby, the lobby that we have right now anyway. We're about to have a new lobby soon. Really? Yeah. OK. Tell me about that. Well, we're actually building a brand new uh, headquarters uh, right here on the facility in Largo. And uh, we're going to double our, our administration space. And more importantly, we're going to be building a customer design center along with a larger engineering department. So we're pretty excited about that talking about customer design so a person comes to you and they first decide what size they want what size boats do you make uh, we make boats all the way from 24 feet to 47 feet about 12 different models and and that's basically what they do is they, they meet with us and we do a design session and we figure out how they're going to use the boat because we don't build any stock boats everything we build is sold and, and we have around a 53 million dollar backlog right now one of a kind one at a time Absolutely. That's, that's how we do it, and that's what's really brought us all our success. So they decide the colors and what they're going to do with the boat, okay, and you draw it up accordingly. Correct. And, and we'll, we'll figure out how they use the boat and, and what's best for them. And, and in a lot of cases, we'll, we'll, there'll be you know, uh, options that come with the boat that they'll never need. And there's, and there's some that aren't listed that we know about because we've done so many custom items, everything from tenders to hardcore fish to cruisers. It's, it's basically tailored to you a la carte. So there's no showroom. You don't pick your boat out. No, no, there's no showroom, there's, there's no stock product. Uh, if you come to the factory, we're able to show you boats that are in process, or if you go to our sales office at the Harbor Time Marina in Dania, we have sold boats that are there that customers keep there that uh, we can also show you. You can get an idea of what it's going to look like. Absolutely. Between that or even on, on the web, we have a great uh, website. But every one of them is different. Yes, every one of them has their own flair and their own taste and their own colors. And I mean, you choose everything. You choose every single option, all the colors, the, the fabrics, uh, exactly how you want it. Now, when you begin to build a boat, okay, before we start with the hull, you do what's called a mock-up? Yeah, well, when we prototype things, yes. the mock-up is really what makes a difference for us. I mean, you can draw the prettiest pictures in the world, and, and until you can really lay hands on it, walk on it, touch it, feel it, that's the only way that uh, really works for us. Uh, I, I've seen a lot of other manufacturers that draw the drawing and, and, and buy in. And uh, let me tell you, we've drawn some drawings that I, I was feeling really good about until we mocked it up and then walked through it and realized that wasn't wasn't exactly what we were looking for. All right, let's go find out about the mock-up right now. Now, after they do the drawing, get done with the engineering, they actually do what's known as a mock-up. Here it is, folks. This is what the boat's going to look like. Why do you do this? This is Mark Beaver, by the way. Well, we take the concept, and then we develop it into engineering. And then what we do is we want to build a full-scale mock-up so we can get a really good feel for what we're going to be doing. Yeah, we can see the space up here on the main deck. There's the uh, helm, here's the captain's chair, and even this chair is kind of special, huh? Uh, yeah, this chair is very unique. It's going to convert itself into a, a, another captain's chair on the other side. The reason why we do mock-ups is because in most cases when you draw something, and we, we do, we draw a lot of detail in what our expectations are for a new product, it's just not the same as being able to lay your hands on it. Um, I've had many drawings that we we're all really happy with and then did a mock-up and then walked through it or sat in it and it, it didn't feel right. It just wasn't what we wanted it to be and the mock-up gives you the chance to really have that reality check and I think that's one of the benefits that we do here uh, over some other manufacturers. You know at some point if you go into the tooling process with a set of drawings that you're happy with and you go through the expense of cutting all the tooling 
for this new product, after you start putting this thing together, at that point you're invested so much that it is what it is, and I think that in some cases a manufacturer has to settle at that point. We don't. We won't settle. You know, we'll we'll mock it up, and in some cases we've mocked up boats and changed them 50 times until we get it right. And it takes as long as it takes. Uh, we'll bring in customers and we'll get feedback from them uh, along with our sales staff and our, our Dania facility, and you know, it, it really puts the entire package together when we come out with a new boat. Now down there, forward, okay, there's the V-berth, there's the head, you can see how big that's gonna be, how big the shower is gonna be, the shape of everything, how that's gonna look. The aft deck back there has the drawing on it, and so once they do the mock-up and you decide, yeah, it, it looks good on paper, but it looks good standing in it too. Exactly, uh, it's, it's a real important that we do a full-scale mock-up and we get it exactly like we want it. Okay, now we start with the hull. Single step for us works really well because uh, what a step does on the bottom of a boat is it induces air. And you want that perfect chemistry of the amount of air to produce lift, to break that suction underneath the boat, and, and to cushion the ride. Basically, it'll pack air between the water surface and the hull bottom to create a, a nice, dry, efficient ride. Uh, in some cases, you can induce too much air. You know, I've had I've had people come to my booth at the boat shows and ask about step hulls, and they've heard that they spin out, and um, which is isn't really true. Um, the only time you'll ever hear stories of that is when you have some kind of a hull design that may give you the opportunity to induce too much air. And for us, single step works perfect. That, folks, is called a mold. That's how it all begins right here. They're going to put fiberglass in there, right, Mark? That's correct. It's all hand-laid, multi-directional fibers that are laid inside of the mold. But your fiberglass is a little different. We'll get to that in just a minute and tell them why. Then right over here is the stringer. In, in boat language, a stringer is like a frame. Exactly. It's the structural system that is supportive of the hull. Yeah, and I see it's, it's very complicated, the stringer is. Yes, all the panels, we're, we all make the panels in-house. They're uh, all high-density foam with glass vacuum bag on both sides, so it's a really stringent process, but you get the ultimate strength and lightweight. And we'll get to that in a minute. We're going to show you how they do that and why they do that, but this frame is going to go in that mold. That's correct. So we're starting to see a boat come together right here. Now, I told you I'd tell you about why the fiberglass is so special that goes in the hull, and what's so special about the stringer. Stay with me. This edition of Pleasure Boaters being brought to you by Intrepid. All right, now these are the four by eight sheets of the special material. It looks like plywood, but it's not plywood. Actually, it's a high density foam core that we actually manufacture in-house. You make this four by eight sheet here. Absolutely, we, uh, we manufacture, we vacuum bag it um, with the glass on both sides of it. What we do when we make our stringer panels, we do that in-house and we do that with a foam core and we use our impregnator machine, which the, what the impregnator does is it gets the exact catalyst to resin ratio that you, that you need to, to the cloth that you're using. So that way it's not brittle, uh, it doesn't get hot, um, it, it gives you the quality that you're looking for, it's not too heavy. And uh, we'll bag 10 sheets at a time. Uh, then once that cures, after it's bagged, we'll bring that to the CNC department and that's when we'll actually cut them and kit them uh, and, and return them to glass shop. It's a, it's a long process, but when you're talking about the structure of the boat, uh, the, the grid system that goes inside the hull, it's, it's worth the extra time. So this is a boat? That's, that's a complete hull stringer system. Right, and it looks like a jigsaw puzzle. You got this tab goes in this slot and so forth. Exactly, it's all designed to actually snap together one way. So can't it's key. get anything wrong. It's key. It's all key, yes. So you didn't know it was this complicated, did you folks? Wood was used a long time ago uh, for strength and to hold the laminate when you do uh, any fiberglass lamination work, but it, it rots, it decays. You know, even marine plywood has a very short longevity. Uh, the Venicel foam core and any kind of foam cores that we use are water resistant. They don't hold water, they won't rot, and therefore uh, will last a lifetime. That is fiberglass, rolls of fiberglass material. That's really what your boat is made out of. 
But have you ever heard of using a CNC machine to cut fiberglass? I mean, every place in the world does it with a pair of scissors, Mark. No, everything that we use uh, is really heavy, heavy knitted fabrics. Very hard to cut with scissors. So we have tungsten carbide tips that we use on this Eastman machine to cut all the materials exactly how we want to cut. So the CNC machine actually cuts it out so it fits perfectly in the hole. Absolutely perfect. Down to the very last inch, it cuts all the overlaps, and it also labels and prints it by number so it's all coded. And there's build books that show exactly where every piece goes. So there'll be a number on there and you know exactly what hole it goes in and where it goes in the hole. Correct. Amazing. Now folks, after it gets cut on the CNC machine, here's a build sheet with all the numbers, all of the steps. This is a boat, believe it or not. There's all the fiberglass with all the numbers that Mark told us about. Okay, now here's the secret. You're not gonna have to kill me, are you? Because no, no, no. we're showing this on TV. <laughs> this is called vacuum bag infusion. Explain it. Correct. What we do is, the fabrics that you saw cut on the Eastman machine are all cut to fit this exact part. Now what we do is all of the fabrics and foams get attached dry. In other words, there's no resin. Laminating doesn't even begin yet until we get ready to pull a vacuum on it and then we infuse the resin into it. And when you're vacuuming, you can actually see the air bubbles moving out, being sucked out by the vacuum. Correct, all the air and all the fluid travels one way. Vacuum bagging, the, the main advantage to vacuum bagging is um, to reduce the amount of air that's in a part and to reduce the possibility of having uh, any kind of malfunction in the layup. Uh, you're able to compress everything, pull out any excess resin, and it really creates a better part, you're somewhat like an aircraft industry type of part. And then you're putting in the resin, and you can actually see that because it's colored, right? So you can see it moving. You can see it flow through all the materials. And it's all designed to flow through even the foams and the sheets that also go inside of the gunnels in this particular instance in this deck. So boy, everything is resin. It is, and the nice thing about this process is it's perfect. The ratio of the cloth to the resin is perfect every single time. And that's why we have all these little squares. Those are actually channels to let the resin flow through. Exactly. And not as simple as you thought, is it, folks? Now, it's a very complicated system. It's very expensive to do, but again, you end up with a perfect fiberglass part every single time. Today's nautical knowledge question is, what's a Mariner's six foot unit of measure called? The answer to this week's nautical knowledge question, what's a Mariner's six feet unit of measure called? Fathom. What's going on with these engines, Mark? It looks like they're all being sanded down. And... Yeah, this is our paint department. Um, almost all of our engines are ordered by our customers to be painted in a color to match the hull colors that we do. So this, is, this all happens here. It all gets staged, the engines come in, they get stripped, sanded, and then a multi-stage urethane coating goes on them along with several clear coats. Uh, and then we put everything back together and then it goes over to assembly. And how many engines it gets and what kind of engine is how fast you want to go, right? Exactly. After a while, folks, we'll show you a gorgeous engine. If you watch Pleasure Boater, you know what a 7 is. If you don't watch Pleasure Boater, you may not know, but you're going to want to know, so stay tuned for that. We don't buy wiring harnesses because um, I'm still not a big believer in the Deutsch plug system. I know that most manufacturers feel very comfortable with it because it's very efficient. Let's face it, if you can buy harnesses that you can just pull through the boat and just plug everything in, uh, that would increase our efficiency uh, drastically here at Intrepid Power Boats. But anytime there's a point where there's a, a connection or a contact, there, there's a place for a failure. There's a place for water to get in, and there's something about electricity and water that really doesn't mix. So what we do here is we build harnesses that are one-piece harnesses where they go right from the switch uh, and they terminate, uh, whether it's at the pump or whatever the electrical device is. And even so much that if for some reason on the line we cut a harness shorter than it should be, we won't, we won't splice anything in. There is no splices on any of our harnesses that we make here. We'll actually pull the entire wire out and, and redo the entire harness. 
And here's an example. You can see the size of the wire right here. This says power steering. It's probably for a joystick. And show me about the ends right there. Well, all the ends are double crimped, and then we solder all the wires inside, and then we wrap it with an epoxy-based heat shrink coating. The best electrical joint there is is a solder joint, believe me, folks. And this is all copper. It's all tin-coated copper. No yes. aluminum in, in your no, wiring. Because no, copper is the best wire. conductor that there is. And you're doing all the consoles right here. Yeah, all the center consoles get done. It's kind of the heart of a center console. We rig and wire the consoles first, then we set it and pull the wire. And then over to the side over here is where we do all of our house panels, which are 110, 220. Yeah, I see a master bus over here Correct. On, on this. Okay, a big ground Just bus. Just starting construction on a, on a relay system. Oh yeah, for the engines. Boy, what nice, neat work, huh? Perfect. Everything in-house. One at a time. The saying uh, one of a kind, one at a time comes from uh, the fact that we don't have any dealers. We have no dealership network and we build each boat per person. And the reason that we do that is because we feel that each product is tailored to suit each person individually. It's basically a la carte. So you, you come into us and you tell us how you use your boat, what you want it to do, and we cater it to you and we build it exactly the way that you want it. Now when Intrepid says they make everything here at their Intrepid plant, they're not kidding. All of the bait boxes, all of the lockers, all of the storage boxes, all of the seats, everything's made, including the cabinetry. And folks, take a real close look right here, okay, inside, this is all fiberglass. Exactly. This is a mold that we make out of fiberglass and then we veneer it with, uh, this is actually maple with a high gloss finish to it. Wow. So it looks like wood, but yet it's lightweight. Wow. And that's another reason they go so fast. It just isn't the big engines like the 7. <laughs> There's that name again. I'll show you later in the show what a 7 is. This edition of Pleasure Boaters being brought to you by Intrepid. Now, how many boats are being built right here? Uh, in this building right now, we have about 15 boats in construction. All different models and sizes? Correct. All custom built to that customer's order. And you have stage one we're looking at over there. You, you can see one just beginning coming in the door. Exactly. We have a hull, which is the major piece, and then a, a liner and a deck. Those all get fitted and all glassed together in that particular station one. Then in station two, Station two, we set consoles and we start wiring the boats. And then it moves on to station three where we set engines and tops. And then it moves out to the prep area outside where we get it ready for a sea trial. How long does it take you to build a typical Intrepid? It takes, for 32, it's from start to finish, it's 17 days. For some of the larger sport yachts, it's 30 days. Okay, and this is all part of the process. This is absolutely fascinating right up here. All the different size vessels you make. Right, and all the different models down each and every line that's out here. There's five production lines that we have. And all the molds that you saw outside, they all feed this one location. Well, after we sea trial, and we do, we sea trial every single boat that we build here. We take it out in the Gulf and we put a few hours on it and, and beat it up because if anything's going to come loose on it, we want it to come loose on us here at the factory. Then we bring it back and we do uh, a quality control sheet from that sea trial. Once that gets worked off, it goes to another area which is called our detail area and that gets another set of quality control eyes on it. Someone totally separate that hasn't seen it yet. And we have those stages all the way through the production lines. Uh, not only do we have the QC managers that do checkpoints, the managers and lead people for each one of those departments also create their own. It's, it's a long uh, process for the quality control process. but. You know, it's, it's important that uh, we catch anything here, and when we deliver product, we don't get the phone calls later. Mark, these are hatches, right? And this tells you exactly what boat it goes into. Yes, correct. They're all labeled for which hull and the hull number it goes into. This is what we call our small parts cart, and these were the press mold parts that I was showing you earlier. And what's unique about these is they come out of a, a two-piece mold perfect and they're finished on both sides and the unique thing about the edge is we developed a resin when we manufacture these that actually turns white when it cures 
That way you don't have to paint the edge. It always stays that color. And you were able to do this because of that uh, air-powered press mold. Exactly. Uh, here at Intrepid, we have about 350 employees. You know, we're on seven and a half acres, and we build on about 120,000 square foot of building. It's it's probably because we're fanatics, and and you can really dial in uh, things when you do it by hand. Uh, we just feel that that craftsmanship, that that fit and finish, can't be replicated uh, at this juncture anyway. As far as I'm concerned, wh whether it be by robotics. Or, or any other process. It's still, in this day and age, a, a true craftsman type of product. Well, that will bring to a close another edition of Pleasure Boater. And oh, you want to know about a seven? We talked about that two or three times. Ladies and gentlemen, meet the seven. That's right, that is the most powerful outboard engine known to man. And the people at Intrepid pioneered that on boats Matter of fact, this one has three sevens, as you see here, that's near completion. Take a look. You recognize that? That is a Cadillac CTSV supercharged engine with custom headers on it. So it probably is actually more than 557 horsepower that you find in the Cadillac CTSV. They put four of these on a boat before, right? Now, if you want to like a more of a moderate 250 horsepower Yamaha Mercury, something like that, that's around $25,000 per engine. A seven is about $85,000. Like the old sign in the speed shop used to say, speed costs money, how fast do you want to go? Remember, one of a kind, one at a time. Now, in the next episode of Pleasure Boater, we're going to get with the liquid fire intrepid team and go deep sea fishing. You'll enjoy that next time. Until then, so long, everyone.